Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems. My very biased collection as usual. Um, today I would like to talk about, well, there will be a theorem, but let me just start by talking about a certain type, a certain class of algebras that I called, well, that's not I called, that I called Hacker algebras, named after uh, a German mathematician with the name Hacker. Okay. And I want to sell this idea, also it will take us a long time to get there, Kind of the classical idea uh, that this is actually some kind type of counting, kind of type of counting algebra. Um, as I said, it will take us a while to get there, and it took me like a long, long time to understand that this algebra is actually a counting type of algebra because um, the way I learned it and the way it is nowadays, most of the time, I think presented is very different. And then there is this magic isomorphism theorem, and everything is actually the same. So I'm going in historically the wrong order. I'm explaining kind of the modern point of view. It's not really modern, it's like the 60s or something. But anyway, I explain the not original point of view uh, someone like Hacker would have taken. Um, but yeah, fine, why not? Uh, we can change what we think is the right way of explaining things. That's just how it works, right? So usually um, theorems or kind of theories maybe I actually polished over the years. And they look nicer uh, than how they originated. But it's still kind of interesting to keep the origin in mind. And I count the origin counting. But up to the last slide, you won't see any counting at all. OK, so let's have, let's have a look here. Um, so I start with the symmetric group. Everyone likes the symmetric group. I like the symmetric group. I hope you like the symmetric group. Everyone likes the symmetric group. Um, and I would like to explain it in a kind of more playful way, which might be um, maybe different from what you are uh, used to. And I will just do the following. So here I have a symmetric group in eight elements, which I just call S8. And I put eight, uh, well, one, two, three, four, five, up to eight at the bottom of a diagram. And I just put some strings and they permute the numbers, right? So I just put here, let's do this one here. It permutes the numbers. It shifts one to the second point, shifts three to the first point, it shifts four to the third point and two to the fourth point and so on. And this defines me a permutation of the numbers downstairs. You can just read off the permutation upstairs. So every one of these funny string diagrams, that's what I call them, right? They're like strings, they're connecting bottom points with top points, defines me an element of the symmetric group. Um, there's some little ambiguity how to do it. Like if I would draw something like this, then this would be the same, something like this. Um, but getting rid of this ambiguity is kind of really well known. Anyway, I would like to play this game of strings. And if you know this game of strings, then yeah, symmetric group. Every, everyone likes symmetric group. I hope you do like the symmetric group. Um, so that's kind of cool, but it's kind of a two-dimensional version, right? So maybe we really want to think of those as being strings that we have between our fingers. And then this is clearly a three-dimensional game we are playing and not a two-dimensional game. So what can we actually do um, in this three-dimensional game? So how can we make this a three-dimensional game. So how can we make the symmetric group stringy picture a three-dimensional game? So let's have a look um, what people have discovered a long time ago, actually. But uh, yeah, so the point of view of using diagrams in mathematics is rather new. Um, but it's kind of, of course, uh, people have played around with those ideas for a long time. And again, everything was polished over time. So it's kind of a little bit weird that in um, kind of, you learn very early on the diagrams are somewhat bad. But they're actually not, uh, whatever, whatever. Let's just go for it. So, um, so I, I just beef up my two-dimensional picture here on the right-hand side by just putting, remembering which strand goes over and under, and this really now presents the same picture as before. But now I remember which strand goes over and under, and this really corresponds on the other side to having a real kind of kind of strength between my my uh, hands. And one of them goes over and one of them goes under, right? So hopefully this makes some sense. So my three-dimensional picture on the left corresponds to this two-dimensional shadow type where I just keep track of what goes over and under. And well, the, the formal object here is called the braid group. So it's not the symmetric group anymore, it's now the braid group. Um, and the symmetric group is a quotient of the braid group by just saying, well, the overcrossing is the undercrossing. Uh, this is really kind of a bad picture. Let me move it a little bit to somewhere where we can see it, maybe up here. 
the overcrossing is the undercrossing. Um, and so we just denote this by no crossing at all. And I should keep my color code. Okay, so fine. So that's the break group is the quotient of the somatic group. So we really beefed up the picture, right? So we're going to the somatic group, we lost some information. Um, as right, Kelly, there's just one problem. So the braid group has got a really beautiful object. I have a lot of topology and geometry going on, but it's like very, very, very difficult. So there are still mysteries about the braid group. Uh, let's just say in particular, it's, it's infinite. It's almost always infinite. So as soon as you have two strands, uh, what, what, the one strand one is not infinite, but as soon as you have two strands, you can put arbitrary many of those guys on top of one another. So it's just like winding around, winding around even more, and that element will never be trivial. So you have infinitely many elements in the braid group. And whenever you work in mathematics and there's something infinite, it's always a bit, uh, it's always a bit ugly. Uh, so let's tr somehow try to avoid it. So what you're trying to do is avoid it. So metric group is somewhat not rich enough. And the braid group's beautiful, but somehow too, too rich. It's too complicated. So the idea is, can we find something that somewhat sits in between? And just have a look at this funny relation. So for the symmetric group, um, this relation that I've drawn before just simplifies. And remember for the symmetric group, I can forget which crossing goes over and under. So I can just write down this picture instead of this one here. But anyway, um, that's the relation for the symmetric group. And for the break group, it satisfies no relation at all. I also said that it just winds around and winds around and winds around and never stops. And the idea is now to impose some relation on, on those crossings, such, uh, such that something like this holds. And it turns out this is kind of a relation people write down up to convention. Sense. So it's an order two relation, the square of the crossing. So if you want to write this in terms of uh, crossing, let's say T is a crossing square, then you have a T here, there's just a crossing and here you have that entity. Uh, can I, what do I want to do? I want to write that entity. Very good. So, right. So, you force an order two relation on the piece. You're not saying it's trivial, uh, right? Like, like in the symmetric group, it, it, it is its own inverse. And you have this flawed relation with this error term here. Um, so, it's not quite, it's, it's not quite uh, just flipping the crossings as for the symmetric group, but you only have an order two relation. And that order two relation will eventually help you to see that this, this algebra that you get, so now it's an algebra, not a group anymore, because you throw in scalars and sums. Uh, but anyway, this algebra that you will get will be actually finite. And it somewhat sits in between the break group and symmetric. And it's kind of fun, because there's this funny cube. Um, don't worry too much about how the parameters really look like. That's kind of a convention issue. And this is just the one I just stole. Whatever, it doesn't matter. But the point is, if you set Q2 as one, that's kind of a quantization. And this term uh, actually dies, and we have our symmetric group relation back again, right? So this term dies at q equals one, or here, this term dies at q equals one, and we have the identification uh, as for the symmetric group. So it's kind of an in-between thing that if you specialize appropriately, you get back our symmetric group, the best thing ever. Now, is the symmetric group the best thing ever? It comes good. Anyway. So, and the statement is this hacker algebra usually denoted by H n, where n is the number of strands. Um, and our symmetric group S n, again, n is the number of strands, is by definition um, this algebra where you have this relation for the ti. Uh, so, exactly what I did before, you force this order two relation with this guy vanishing at q equals one, right? This goes to zero for q equals one. So this guy is vanishing uh, for q equals one, and you just force this order two relation on the crossing. And kind of the fun fact is that you have now an algebra which still remembers over and under, but it's just the size of the symmetric group. It is not like the braid group. It's not like an infinite beast. Yeah, but Selma really sits in between bows um, in some sense. And people have worked this out in way more general. So it's kind of this in-between quotient between the break group and the symmetric group, if you want. Uh, also, the symmetric group in this case is specialization, right? Setting Q equals one. And that's pretty cool. So you now have an algebra where you can actually play some break games, right? So, but it's still finite. So you can use standard linear algebra techniques, for example, to attack problems uh, about the break group. 
about the brain group, yeah, absolutely, uh, but also about sweater groups and hacker articles. And yeah, this actually, I should say that, I guess I already did, this actually works in quite some generality, uh, even beyond box language. But let's let's stay with the semantic group. Everyone loves the semantic group. You hopefully love the semantic group. Anyway, so <laughs> now coming back to counting, so this was not the original definition. This actually came much, much, much later, this interpretation. Um, the graphical one is a bit difficult to track down, but someone like Bowen Jones knew that already in the 80s. And um, kind of this description by a generator as a relation is due to Eva Hori and co authors. Uh, that's why this algebra is sometimes also called the Eva Hori hacker algebra. But anyway, the original kind of the origin of the hacker algebra is actually in counting and number theory. Well, counting and number theory is not quite the same. Counting could also be geometry finite geometry, for example, or gubernatorics. And this is exactly where this comes from. There is a nice space, which is called the flat manifold, which is essentially just the idea of having a, a line, so a one-dimensional space, in a two-dimensional space, in a three-dimensional space, in a whatever-dimensional space, right? So you have one-dimensional space, two-dimensional space, this was really bad, in a two-dimensional space, in a three-dimensional space, and so on. So that's called a flat manifold. And people studied those for a long time. Like, how many ways are there to put a line into, uh, uh, how many ways are there to put a line into a plane, into, a, well, volume, and so on. So kind of counting those possibilities. In particular, if you do that over a finite field, then this is really a counting thing. You really count how many options do you have. And the way to do this formally is the following. So that's what people did. Uh, so you define the general linear group over the finite field and the, let's say the Borel of upper triangular matrices. So B is, a, is called the Borel, um, the Borel subalgebra or whatever. But anyway, just let's just say upper triangular matrices. And then this flag manifold is this space. And if you think about what this is doing, this is exactly my picture above because I kind of mod out by action of upper triangular matrices. And this is kind of reordering the rows and columns such that your matrix has some type of type of a block form, and then you can see various spaces inside of various spaces of higher dimension. Right? So that's what you do. And originally, the hacker algebra was defined as the endomorphisms of, 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 the, of this beast. And it's essentially just uh, counting certain objects in the flag manifold. And of course, I have a little typo here and got to telling you about counting points in these funny things, and then I put just a B here. So this guy should be G mod B. So really the flag manifold. And counting points in the flag manifold. And this endomorphism algebra is um, the hack algebra. And the Q, the funny Q I used before, is here the Q of the finite field. And this is how it really arose. And then Ivahori wrote down the generators and relations presentation. And as soon as you have that on, you can kind of generalize and forget about counting points uh, on black manifolds. I hope it makes some sense. Um, so this hacker algebra kind of a strange objects. For me, really, that's what I learned. It comes from break groups, uh, but it really doesn't. It comes from counting points on flag manifolds in the end. But it's the same type. And nowadays, it's kind of everywhere because there you go. It comes from some natural Lie theory, but it also comes from some uh, natural topology. So and then there, there are many other applications of the hacker algebra. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.